Welcome to the Grant Writing Simplified Podcast. Here you'll learn how to make a big impact as a grant writer. I'm Teresa Huff, former special ed teacher turned grant writer and nonprofit strategist. My why is to help nonprofits fulfill their why. As grant writers, we have the opportunity to do that in a big way. I'm here to mentor grant writers like you who are ready for a fulfilling, flexible career while leveraging your skills, growing your earning potential, and making a meaningful difference in the world. Through my podcast, coaching, and training programs, I'll teach you the strategies I've used to develop millions in sustainable nonprofit funding. Together, we can create a ripple effect to change the world. Let's do this. Hey friends, welcome to episode 98. This week we are talking about a topic that I have been looking forward to for a really long time. It's something I've wanted to address on the show, but just hadn't come across the right guest yet. Well, this week is it. Before I get ahead of myself, lately we've been talking about the importance of clarity in our work and also individually and getting really clear on our core vision for what we want to accomplish and why we're doing it. And then that will help us engineer what we really need to be focusing on. Last week's guest, Jordan Rayner, really helped us think through that of what do you need to be excellent at and what do we need to eliminate? And I will be the first to admit this is a work in progress for me, but it gets more and more clear over time. I am talking about these things because I want to encourage you to keep pursuing this path to excellence and keep pursuing clarity within your team and within your grant writing work. This also starts within ourselves. And some of that comes with knowing who we are as a person, how we're designed, and understanding who we are not. Sometimes that's just as helpful. And learning more about myself over time has helped me gain a lot of clarity about what type of work is a great fit for me and my skills, my talents, my personality, and which things are really not. And then which things are a bit of a challenge or a stretch, but I really do need to push myself. So it's helped me make those decisions and to make better decisions, what to eliminate and what to pursue. And it's also helped me understand other people a lot better, the way they operate, the way they approach decision-making and interactions. I wish I had learned about this years earlier. Today, I am talking with a special guest who hosts the Quiet and Strong podcast, especially for introverts. I'm talking with David Hall. He is the author of the book, Minding Your Time, which he graciously sent me a copy of, and I really enjoyed reading it. And I've read quite a bit about introversion over the last few years, but this had some different applications and some new ways of looking at situations or certain approaches that I really appreciated. And part of the reason I wanted to talk about this on the podcast is because a lot of podcast listeners who come to me and want to pursue grant writing are introverts. And I haven't figured out yet if grant writers tend to be introverts because of the type of skills and deep thinking required, or if it's just introverts know a fellow (laughs) introverted person so they can relate. But either way, you either are one or you know many, which makes sense. And so the more we can understand each other, the more we can interact with grace and kindness. I love this quote from David, today's guest. He says, we do come with natural gifts and abilities, and sometimes it's so natural that we don't recognize what a gift it is. I try to emphasize that in my programs when I'm working in the Fast Track to Grant Writer with students in the program to really recognize which things are a gift that light you up that you can use to serve well. That is something that I want to dig into today. I highly recommend that you check out David's podcast, The Quiet and Strong Podcast by David Hall. So without any further introduction, I hope you enjoy this episode. David, welcome to the show. I am so excited about this topic today. Before we dive in, tell us a random fact about yourself. Okay, well... Hello, Teresa. A random fact. Um, I 
come from a big family. I'm one of nine. And that oh. might play into our conversation today, too. <laughs> wow, that is a big family. So, three boys. I'm one of three boys and six sisters. Wow. Where are you in the lineup? What I'm the third. I have two older sisters, and then I'm the third. Okay. So you're the oldest boy. Yeah. Which, yeah, that that is something that I think sometimes we forget to take into account when we're learning people's personalities and some of the dynamics. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your journey. I know you also host a podcast, which I recently discovered, thankfully, and is a topic that I'm fascinated with. And the way you present it is very practical. What led you to this point? Okay. The podcast is the Quiet and Strong podcast, especially for introverts. And I'll talk about that, my journey to figuring out I am an introvert. I will always be an introvert. But there's great strengths that come from it, and that that's for everybody. About half the population are introverts, and there's a lot of misunderstanding around it, but it's something that's very natural. But understanding it can really help you be successful and uh, embrace your gifts and be yourself. That's, that's the most important thing. So that's probably where I want to start this is you know, I've always been fascinated. Why are some people successful? You know, why is this person doing well and this person's not doing so well? Uh, you know, especially when I was younger, I, I tried to be something I wasn't. And one mm -hmm. of the words I don't like very much is gregarious. Uh, mm -hmm. I wanted to be gregarious, right? I wanted to have that charisma I saw in other people. And I didn't get why I didn't have that. And it was it's definitely a long journey figuring out who I was and and what I needed to be successful. I got a bachelor's degree in psychology trying to figure things out. I started working in higher ed and so I I've been around grants just uh, I'm not a grant writer but I'm very familiar with grants and in my higher ed experience, you know, I've advised students and during this time, I got a master's in counseling in my early days at the college, and I also uh, started getting into some good professional development that the college provided. So I got certified in the Myers-Briggs, the Myers-Briggs Type Indicator, you know, tells you about your personality. If anybody's familiar with that, I'm an INTJ. But as I was doing that, the facilitator said something that's really key to all this. She said, introverts, they think and then speak and extroverts speak in order to think and that was like a big light bulb moment for me i'm like oh yeah that's a difference i'm definitely thinking and then you know sharing what i think is most important and versus my extroverted colleagues might just be sharing everything. And again, when I'm talking, I'm not ever bashing extroverts. We need everybody. All the personalities are good, but they're different and you have to understand the differences. So that was really helpful, that part. And then another thing was we started using Strengths Quest at the college. It's also been called Strengths Finder. It's now called Gallup Strengths. And I went through that, but then I also became a trainer for it. And the basic idea is they have 34 themes of talent or strengths. And you take this assessment and you get your top five. And the idea is you focus on your strengths and not, you know, not your weaknesses. I mean, we have to deal with our weaknesses. And it wasn't all about introversion, extroversion, but it really was just the same kind of theme. Like, yeah, these are natural gifts. You have natural gifts. And, and mine were along the lines of, you know, analytical and ideation, which means you have a lot of ideas and that kind of thing. And when I was presenting, there was plenty of people in the room that were kind of resistant, you know, because they were kind of told you're going to go do this training and they may not have volunteered for it. And so, you know, there's, there's people with you know, their arms crossed in the room, like, Hey, you know, I don't believe what you're telling me here. And, <laughs> tough crowd. and so, yeah, there, there was, there was some, that was a tough crowd. And and as I'm thinking about this, you know, because it's it's a could be a three day training or something like that. So I'm thinking about this, like kind of some of the people's, you know, some people were were thinking it was great, but there was a few that were resisting it. And I was chatting with the neighbor, and we were talking about just this some small talk, like, "Hey, where do you work?" kind of thing. And and I told him where I worked, and he's like, "Oh, 
you're right across the street from me. And I'm like, oh, where do you work? And he told me, and I'm like, huh, that doesn't ring a bell. <laughs> and where he worked, it, this is such a crazy story. I'd been driving by there for about 10 years. And there's, it's a big place. It's huge. And there's signs. And what point I'm making is I realized that when I'm driving, especially to you know familiar places, I'm in my head. I'm thinking. I'm in deep thought. I go into my zone. I get a lot of good thinking done there on my drive. Same. And, and it's very natural to me. That's my point. It's very natural. So I'm not necessarily looking at the sign on his company, but I'm thinking. And sometimes I joke that my, my work might need to pay for some of my commute time because I'm solving <laughs> some work, work problems while I'm driving. That's the truth. But, but anyway, it was just, it was one of those epiphanies like, oh, we do come with natural gifts and abilities. Sometimes they're so natural, we don't recognize what a gift it is. Yes. And that's the thing. That's why these conversations are so important. With the Strengths Quest, I also give an example. It's one of those things where you're in a workshop, and you have some small group discussions at your table, and you talk about your different strengths. So I'm sitting by someone, and one of Gallup's strengths on this assessment is empathy. And the way they define it is that you are feeling the feelings of others. Okay. And normally you just look at your top five, but again, I, I got all 34 and uh, don't judge me, but empathy was number 34 for me. Oh, okay? ouch. <laughs> and, it, and it doesn't mean I don't care about people. I'll explain that. But her explaining, how she experiences life was so good because she feels the feelings of others. And, you know, you may too. And for some reason, I'm not creative that way. I don't know why, Mm -hmm. but see with my gifts, I'm a definitely an analytical thinker. And if I want to help, or I'm concerned about you, I'm going to imagine what it's like to be going through what you're going through. Whereas other people have this gift just to to feel what somebody's going through, which can be a gift. And also sometimes it can be a burden too, Mm -hmm. but just those kinds of conversations, you know, like we're having today, it's just so important because we all have our gifts and strengths and they really need to be understood. And so those kinds of experiences really helped shape. Yeah. You know what? I am an introvert. I, I need to be proud of this. There's a lot of great strengths that come from it. There's a lot of things that I need. So it's all about strengths, needs, and strategies for success. And there's definitely a lot of myths out there. Oh my, yes. And I'd like to get into those. And part of the reason I wanted to talk about this was because, like you said, about half the people are likely introverts, which means whether you are one or not, you interact with us every day (laughs) and whichever one you are you are surrounded by the others and it's helpful to understand both and the needs of both because they're they are so unique and the strengths they bring to the table are so unique and important to recognize and understand how to draw those out so I think that's huge when we're talking about team dynamics but also just personal dynamics because if you understand yourself and how you work best, how you interact best, how you rest effectively, then it's much more influential and impactful when you come together to do your work. And like you said, your think time is so important. I think a lot when I'm washing dishes, (laughs) you know, it's just nobody (laughs) bothers me because they don't want to get roped into helping. (laughs) Right, right. You're safe there. (laughs) Exactly. That's my alone time. I can just, my hands are busy, but my brain is going a million miles an hour processing things from the day or whatever's going on and solving problems and working through that. So I very much relate (laughs) to what you're saying there. I'm curious, when you did those trainings and the people were resistant up front, how was it different by the end after you took them through that process? Did you see any transformation or less resistance from that? Yeah, definitely. I think think it went well. And I'm sure there was plenty of people that just didn't do anything further with it. Some people, it really, they really embrace that and continue to like look at life with their strengths in that way. So I know for me, it's been hugely eye opening and to overcome some of the myths, which you mentioned, and I'd like to dig more into 
Okay. So let's start with what, unfortunately, it it, it is a problem that you're not going to hear the same definition from everybody. That's, yeah. that's something that I would like to really <laughs> nail down. But <laughs> To me, it, introversion is exactly how it sounds, how Carl Jung defined it a long time ago. It's turning inward. And a lot of great strength comes from that. And it's like I said, it's very natural. So it's turning inward more often than not. And of course, we pay attention to what's going on around us. Of course we do. But we also get drawn into our, our, our world of ideas and imagination you know, more than our extroverted friends do. And they also spend some time internally, but they're more focused on what's going on around them. And again, great gifts come from both. So it's it's really turning inward. And if you don't understand that, that definitely can be a problem for you. And, you know, we talked a little bit before the show, like most of my guests and myself included felt like something was wrong because mm-hmm. we didn't understand that the turning inward was part of who we are and it's not the, everybody's experience yes and another uh, definitely a myth is introversion equals shyness and that's not the case okay. i will say that if you don't understand your introversion that could be a cause of shyness okay and the beautiful thing is you can overcome shyness if that's what you want and shyness really is it's a lack of confidence and you can gain confidence and you can be a very confident introvert, but you're always going to be an introvert. You know, I hear people say, well, I was, and now, no, no, it's it's natural. You can be confident and do all the things that you want to do, but at the core, you're, you're, you know, you're a deep thinker and you're, you're a deep feeler and you're, uh, you're an introvert. And what I mean is, like I said earlier, if you're thinking first and then speaking, and other people are talking nonstop and you're being judged as, oh, why are you so quiet? That can make you feel shy if mm-hmm. you don't understand what's going on, More or you need some, yeah, or you need you need a break and you need to maybe some days you go out to lunch with your friends, but some days you know what I just need to take lunch by myself, <laughs> you know, and um, right. and and you know that scene is weird or awkward or you know why do you need to be alone? So it can cause shyness if you don't understand, but if you understand what you need, that it's normal, you can gain all the confidence in the world and do all the things that you want to do. And that's the beautiful thing about this. So it's not shyness. You can overcome it. Everybody's going to have different needs as far as, I guess the next myth is that we don't like people. I, I don't like that one. <laughs> right. I, you know what? We talked for a long time before you ever hit record and I'm enjoying this conversation so much, Teresa. Me too. Absolutely like people. That's, it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's a silly myth. Right. It's just, we, we want to connect in a deep way. You know, we're, we're talking about something very important to us and it's, it's very enjoyable. We just don't want to make endless small talk, right. you know, we're looking and, for something more meaningful and thoughtful. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, a lot, we do better in one-on-one conversations mm-hmm. or smaller group conversations. Right. We probably don't like the, just the big networking event where you bounce around from person to person, or at least that's the expectation. Mm-hmm. And that's an example. You can bust that expectation. Like, you know what? Maybe I want to make a great connection with this person and that person. And I'm good. I, I This was a successful event where an extra, I think I need to meet all these hundred people. And, <laughs> and you to feel me, that that's, pressure. And yeah, the you anxiety feel that just goes with it. Yeah, but that can be very draining and, and honestly yes. not even effective. It, it, I could do it, but it's not going to be effective. Right. So that's definitely a couple myths. And there's others I, I've talked on my show. When I have guests, I regularly have them bust a couple myths, and there, there's a lot of them out there. But that's oh a couple of the main ones. Yes. But it's a strength, and it's very natural to us. I agree, and I hear those same myths too. One thing that was eye-opening to me was learning that introverts and extroverts, anyone, can be shy, including extroverts. And so what you're saying is that we can overcome that because that is completely separate from whether or not you're an introvert or an extrovert. And that was a very, I guess, unique, eye-opening moment to learn that and to understand that difference, that it's not the same thing. Right. And I I actually feel more sorry for shy extroverts, you know, (laughs) but it's a thing. And it just means that something is, is they're afraid of something. Mm -hmm. 
They're afraid yes. of approaching this person or this situation, and it could be an ex- introvert or extrovert. Right. Overcoming it is going to look different. Yes. You know? And part of my work is how you approach life, whether it be um, public speaking or I wrote my first book on time management. I think you can learn a lot from a fellow introvert, like their strategies for success, mm-hmm. because they're going to be different than the extrovert. Right. And overcoming shyness is the same thing. In fact, a long time ago, I did read a book, Overcoming Shyness, and it just really didn't work for me. And I, I think now is probably it was written by extrovert. Mm-hmm. And the strategies are going to look completely different. Very much. It's not like just get out of your comfort zone. That's not going to work. You right. need to understand what you're afraid of and really challenge that fear. And it's like, you know what? This is normal. People yeah. go through this. This is not a scary thing. And so I don't even say, get out of your comfort zone. I say, change it, you know, change your comfort zone because as introverts, we may be getting out of our comfort zone over and over and over again. And if you don't change your thoughts, you have to keep doing it. But if you change your thoughts, that may just now be part of your comfort zone, which is really the goal. Right. And stretching that zone instead of feeling like stretching. I like that word. Yeah. Stretching, expanding. Uh, Those are great words. Yes. Right. Yes. And that is less intimidating. And for me, it was incredibly helpful to name whatever it was. Like if there's something I'm afraid of or nervous about or whatever, just naming it. And then, okay, I'm dealing with this one thing that I was concerned about or worried. What if that happens or what do I say? But then I don't, because fear has a way of infiltrating everything and affecting everything. So then that nervousness comes through, but by naming it up front, then that helps pinpoint and you can address that one piece of it and then move forward. So that's helped me a lot with the shyness piece and just the awkwardness sometimes of just recognizing and naming, okay, this is probably going to be a little awkward because it's a new situation. I don't know these people. To your point, the bigger the group, the quieter I get. <laughs> yeah. And that's yeah. okay. And if I just find one or two people, I can talk with them and it'll be good. There was one thing I heard recently. I was going to a large conference, probably 4,000 people were going to be there. And on the way, on the ride there, the gentleman sitting next to me, we were talking about it. And he said, Well, are you looking forward to it? And I said, Yeah, I'm just trying to process because this is so big. And kind of overwhelming and all these people. And he said, well, I just like to look at it as friends I haven't met yet. And that totally changed my perception and perspective about walking into this big, overwhelming situation. Like, oh, okay, they're just friends. It's fine. I can walk around and talk to my friends. Even though before I would have thought, okay, they're strangers. Who do I know? Who should I talk to? It's just, I can relax and look at it with a little different approach. Yeah, that's a great way to look at it. And I think also just your expectations might be different than your extroverted colleague, you know? Yes. Um, If you attend with an extroverted colleague, they might want to make friends with every single person, with the all 4,000 people at the conference. Yes. But, you know, if you, it, for, for me, if I make a couple new connections, or maybe I connect with some people that I already know, but connect deeper, Right. you know, I just, it just you might have different goals. Mm-hmm. Yes. And then the other thing with all this, it's like, you know what? You absolutely can get better at all these things. But at the end of the day, give yourself some grace, you know? Oh, we're, yes. We're people. And so it, things might, you might have a little awkwardness and it's, it's okay. Yes. And learning that has been so freeing <laughs> and just yeah. giving myself that space to be, yeah. it's okay. And going into the conference I mentioned, I went into it with one or two clear objectives that I wanted to accomplish or take away from that. And so I could filter the meetings, the opportunities, the conversations through, okay, which things are my priority and which things align with that instead of feeling like I have to go to every session I can back to back all day long, pack it all in and feeling that fear of missing out instead of just this time, it was so much more relaxing because it's like, okay, I can just enjoy, have a mix of downtime by myself and interactive time And I came home refreshed and rested. I didn't come home wiped out like I usually would from a big conference like that. It was a world of difference understanding these concepts. 
Yeah. And I like what you said. It's you come up with your objectives, yes. not somebody else's objectives, your yes. objectives. Exactly. And that, and you know, if you need to take a little walk outside by yourself for a while, it's normal. It's fine. Yes. You know, and definitely people can feel self-conscious about that. Like, Oh, this is weird. No, mm-hmm. it's not, you know, right. do what you need to do. Yes. And used to, I would have felt really weird. Like that wouldn't have occurred to me because I would have felt like that was rude or weird or something yes. wrong. This time it was like, Hey, it's lunchtime. People are just doing their things. I'm just going to go. They had some walking paths around. Yeah. I just kind of went off and explored and it was so nice. <laughs> yeah. And I've been there too, where it felt weird to do that, you know, but yeah. now it's like, it's, it's, it's a normal thing. Yeah. You know? You're going to spend some time with people and then Sometimes you just need a break. Right. And sometimes I just went and sat down and processed some of the things I'd learned or the people I met and made notes at different points during the day before I forgot because later it's all a jumble. So that really helped me sort out. And then when I came home, I could remember different things that I, the highlights, the things I needed to follow up with. It was just so much different. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Well, with all these, I know we've talked about, you mentioned both sides have definite skill sets, introverts and extroverts. And I say sides, that's really the wrong word because <laughs> it's not like we're taking sides. It's just no, both, no. both aspects have a lot of strengths. So how can we discover those and really lean into those skills? So again, conversations like this are very good. There's a lot of assessments out there that people can take. Like I, I use Myers Briggs and the Strengths Finder or Gallup Strengths. There's a lot of other other ones. There's a lot of great books out there. Somebody could talk to a coach or other professional counselor, things like that, or just talk with friends. There's there's lots of different ways. One of the gentlemen that started the whole Strengths thing is Marcus Buckingham. And he just put out a book. I, I, I'm just starting to read it, but uh, it's called Love and Work. But his thing is, you know, he's done a couple different assessments, but he's also like, you can just keep track during the week. Like what strengthened me this week? So, I mean, a- assessments are great, but you can kind of track that on your own. And the other cool thing about being an introvert is we're very reflective. And so we can do a lot of that work ourselves because we, you know, we can look at ourselves and think, okay, what strengthened me this week? What Mm -hmm. drained me and what strengthened me? And how can I do more of that? Mm -hmm. You know, and he'll say, and I'll say that we want to be in the place where we're mostly using our strengths. And, you know, I feel fortunate I'm there, but if you're not, how can you slowly get to be using more of your strengths? And there's always going to be things that we don't want to do as part of our work, but how can we mostly be using our strengths in the work that we do? Right. I like that question and that weekly or even sometimes daily reflection of what strengthened me and what drained me and starting to pay attention to that and keeping track over time because you'll start to see connections and realize. And just because you can do something doesn't mean you should be doing it. Maybe you're capable, but that might not be an ideal task or job or something to take on. But I think sometimes we feel kind of guilty, like, oh, I should be doing that. But should is kind of a, to me, a red flag word. If we keep saying that, we need to stop and pay attention. Like, should I, or is that something I feel pressured and guilty, but I really don't need to do that? Yeah. I mean, is there something somebody else could do, you know, or maybe you're working for yourself. Is there something you can contract out or is there something that you're doing and just really nobody cares if you keep doing that? Right. (laughs) So the reflection, yeah. And the reflection is just important, you know, just to get on that right path. Yes. I've had to get more discerning about signing up for whatever webinars or even in-person groups and different things of like, which ones are really going to be worth my time and mental energy investment and which ones are a distraction from my key goals I need to be working towards and identifying those based on my purpose and work that I need to be doing and putting some boundaries around that has been helpful. Yeah, definitely. Boundaries are Very important. You need to give yourself the space that you need because we are gifted thinkers. And 
there's a lot of reasons why we need some time by ourselves. Again, it's a myth. We don't want to be alone all the time. In fact, that would drive me crazy. <laughs> but um, we need some time to think. So some of it is recharging, like we've been talking about, you know, maybe taking that walk. But some of it is really being strategic. If you're writing a grant, you need to have that time to think about and make a plan what you're doing and yes. or give yourself time to write where you're not getting interrupted all the time mm-hmm. or just some time to dream or just, you know, enjoy your rich imagination. So there's <laughs> reasons why we need alone time. You got to plan that out. Mm-hmm. You know, that's interesting you mentioned that because when I am writing a grant, it's kind of a mix of all those things you said. One is like, I tell my husband, I'm going to go scuba diving now. I'm working. And he knows that means, okay, don't bother her for a while. (laughs) Don't interrupt. She's got to go deep and think and really Uh get into the project. Because if I get interrupted, it's like trying to scuba dive and pop back up every couple minutes to, you know, answer something or do something. And you just can't, you have to go deep and stay deep for a while to really get into the project. Yeah. There's no such thing as multitasking. I mean, it does, it doesn't work. It doesn't like work for introverts. So. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't work for introverts. It doesn't work for ex- extroverts. Mm-hmm. And it's really, you're dividing your attention and you're going back. We can only think of one thing at a time. I've heard people brag that they're excellent multitasker. But when you get distracted, you're like, oh, all right, where did I leave off? Mm-hmm. And you're also likely to make more mistakes that way, jumping back and forth. So we need that focus time. And uh, it's just a really important part of who we are. We almost have to retrain our brains to think that way because society, technology, everything has sort of thrown that off a little bit for us. And we feel like we have to always be on and paying attention in all the directions in case we've missed something. And I think we do need to give ourselves permission to set those boundaries again. Yeah, you have to, you have to. And Another really part, a big part of introvert success is being prepared because we like to think about things. Yes. So if you're going into a meeting, it's so much better if you've given the what's the agenda some thought ahead of time to to figure out if you need to research something or if you need to do something or read something or prepare your questions. What do I need to know about this project? Again, if we go into a meeting cold, we can do fine, but we're better if we prepare. And so part of that is giving ourselves some time to do that. One of the strategies that I've employed that's really been helpful is the first 90 minutes of my day, I block that off. And people at my work have access to my calendar, which is great. You know, we schedule meetings with each other for each other. But at least for the most part, I don't have any meetings the first 90 minutes. You know, I'm flexible. If someone really needs to meet during that time, I'll, I'll, I'll make it happen. But for the most part, I have that time to prepare or to think, you know, or to focus on a project. Sometimes it's crazy to think that we can get a project done and also get interrupted every every other minute. Right. And to do it well and with accuracy, like you said, it does take that deeper thinking. But then yeah. also on the flip side, I sometimes get to a point where I'm just stuck. My brain is not thinking creatively, I'm not processing very well. And I could sit there and try to work through it, but I need to recognize it's time to step away or it's time to go bounce these ideas off somebody else and just sort of move past that. Then I can come back to it and see the answers and okay, now I know what I need to do to finish. So for me also, it's recognizing when do I need to give myself a break and make myself take a break and walk away from it for a little bit and give myself that think time away from the screen. Yeah. And sometimes that's when the best ideas come, you know, when we're doing something else, but we kind of put it in the back of our head, like, okay, here's this thing I'm working on, but you, Mm -hmm. you change your focus for a little bit. So that, that can be, that's been a great strategy for me too. Yeah. Sometimes if I just go out and weed the garden a little bit or (laughs) weed my berries. And that's the best ideas usually hit me when I don't have any paper or my phone with the notes app or anything nearby (laughs) to be able to write it down. (laughs) But that's how it Yeah, it's definitely definitely a problem. And that's another thing. We have a lot of great ideas as introverts. I think that's one of our strengths too. And so normally I do have my phone with me all the time, or I do have a, a, a paper, a notebook, And like you're working on something and you might get ideas on something else. 
And yeah. you really need to capture those so you yes. can keep working. But that might have been a, just a brilliant idea, but it's just yes. not the time for it. So you got to right. capture it. Right. Like I said, I do a lot of thinking while I'm driving. And so sometimes I'll call myself hands-free if it's a, a really good idea. During the pandemic, I didn't do as much driving and I missed that. And you, you were saying that you told your husband you were going scuba diving. <laughs> so like when I was working from home, even though I was working from home, I still needed kind of like that drive time, right? So mm-hmm. I would tell my wife the same kind of thing. I'd say, I'm, I'm going to drive home from work, even though it was just walking from my chair to, to my room. And right. I still needed that space and uh, before I was ready to hang out with everybody. So that's that's kind of funny. Right. I've heard of people even saying when they were working from home that they have almost a ritual to go to work and to come home from work, even if it's just, you know, walking into a different room or putting on a certain type, like an old t-shirt instead of a nicer top or something just to signify to their brain certain transition times, or maybe that's when they take one lap around the block or something just to signify, okay, I'm shifting gears here, moving from work mode to home mode or vice versa. Yeah, for sure. Working from home was a new challenge for me. I mean, people will say, oh yeah, introverts, they love this. <laughs> and I'm not sure I got a re- good uh, introduction to it because you know my wife has always worked from home and she's a fellow introvert. And I have three kids and two of them were now in online school, which they hated. It was a very stressful time. And so working from home at the beginning wasn't the best. It definitely had its advantages. But I mean, there was things. And one of the things that like at work, I probably didn't take as much many breaks because, you know, I'd go to different meetings and things. That was kind of a break. But Mm -hmm. sitting in the same chair, I found I had to take more formal breaks. And that was, again, you just got to continue to evaluate your strategy for how you're working, especially as an introvert. Definitely. Yeah. And that's something like your wife, I had always worked from home since our kids have been born. But it was different having everyone else home too. Yeah, they're in your space. As opposed to me. Yeah, it's like, (laughs) wait a second, this is a different dynamic. And so even still, now that everyone's still back in school and everything like normal, but summers and breaks and holidays and things, I have to think ahead and kind of rethink my work plan and just know that I need to allow more flexibility during those seasons and kind of mentally prepare for that too, of having people in my space. (laughs) Even if they're not around me, it's still different just having people around. Yeah. And I'm not saying this is a great plan, but my wife definitely stays up late sometimes to get her quiet, to do her work. Mm, I get it. Or when the kids were little, sometimes she'd say, I'm going to the store. Oh, don't you want to take the kids? Nope. (laughs) (laughs) No, I get it. (laughs) Love them. But yeah, love them. But I I need, need I need some, I need some space here. Yes. Yes. It's important to recognize what you need and to have that break and fill yourself when you need it and help others understand that too, that this isn't about you. I'm not upset with you. I just need a minute. I think that's that's a real key right there is being able to articulate what we need, especially with those we love. I love you and I'll be better for you if I just have a little space. And because if there's not that understanding and maybe you go to a gathering of friends or family and after a couple hours, you're done. Mm-hmm. If they understand, hey, you know what? Teresa needs a break. Then <laughs> it's 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 normal. And it's not like she hates us kind of thing. It's, it's right. normal. It's just, this is a lot of stimulation for my yeah. brain to process. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was funny. I was talking with introvert extrovert couple and she loves to dance and i think till like three in the morning right and and she just say i he doesn't like to go out dancing with me and then you talk to him it's like yeah i'd love it but by 12 i'm done i'm ready to go home. <laughs> so you just got to understand those differences yeah and find a good compromise where they can both enjoy it instead of feeling like oh what's wrong with this why are we in such a tug of war yeah and you know with all this you know i'm talking about the pandemic I've been blogging for about seven years on these topics. And then I wrote a book a few years ago. 
And then during the pandemic, when I'm hearing all these kind of myths and people feeling bad about themselves for who they are and just discussions of introverts and, oh yeah, introverts are loving this, just being left alone. I don't know if you know when World Introvert Day is, but last year on January 2nd, I I launched my podcast because I really just wanted to give these things more of a voice that, you know what? get to know who you are and be strong about that. I'm glad there's starting to be more conversation around it and more resources like your podcast, because like you referenced earlier, they're both important introverts and extroverts. We need both. They're both equally valuable and enriching for our work, our lives, relationships, everything. And we need to recognize that. And instead of feeling like a misfit, or awkward, or something's wrong with us, like so many of us have, it's actually a superpower that we can lean into and bring so much more value to the world because of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's it right there. And there's still too many people that feel like something's wrong with them. And a lot of my guests have found out later in life that, oh, this is who I am. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. Yeah. And, you know, one of my guests, she was coaching people with stress and things like that. And she was working with this, this lady that was about 80 years old. Then this, this coach was an introvert herself. She's realizing what's wrong is she doesn't understand her introversion. And it, it really caused issues with her marriage and things like that. And, you know, again, she's very late in life figuring out that she's an introvert. And then this friend and guest of mine became a coach for her. She turned her focus to helping introverts. And in fact, she turned her focus to helping like teenagers because she wanted to catch it early. Yes. So people could really embrace their gifts early. And also their parents, whether their parents are introverts or extroverts, could understand early the gifts of their children and how to help them embrace who they are. That is so important. And I'm so glad to see these resources coming up like that. Now you've mentioned your book. Do you want to tell us a little more about that? Sure. So while I'm uh, figuring out that I'm an introvert again, it, it was a long journey for me. Yes, it's a I'm work also in very progress. busy. It's a work in progress. I'm also very busy at work. Uh, so, you know, working full-time, sometimes full-time plus, And, uh, I'm running a business with my wife. It's mostly her, but I'm helping her with a lot of it. Uh, we have three kids. I'm trying to do a blog and other things. And so I'm studying time management. And a, there's a lot of great information on time management productivity. But I'm realizing that as an introvert, I have really specific needs. And we talked a lot about those already. I have specific needs as an introvert. And these books I'm reading don't call introversion out. Now, some of it, could be if you know what you're looking for. But so I wrote my first book, Minding Your Time, uh, Time Management, Productivity and Success, especially for introverts. So it's really about how you can build a time management strategy as an introvert. And it's going to be different than your extroverted friend. The things that we've been talking about, the way you manage your alone time, the way you prepare for things, the way you might manage your ideas, and just the way you can just understand who you are and what you need to be productive and successful. And so that was my first book. And like I said, I think you can learn most from somebody that's similar to you. I'm not saying you can't learn from an extrovert, but when it comes to like time management or public speaking or networking, there are strategies that might apply more to you as an introvert that you can get from a fellow introvert. Mm-hmm. Because you've been in the trenches with us and you get it yeah. firsthand. You know what it's like. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I will definitely link to that in the show notes. So throughout your journey, has there been a resource in particular that's been especially meaningful to you? Yeah, I've read a lot of great books. I'll just call out one. If, if you listen to my show, you might have heard of this one before, but so I was looking for a particular book one day a few years back and I went into Barnes and Noble and they didn't have it. So I was kind of disappointed because I really wanted to read that one and I don't think I could find it in a library or whatever. And as I was walking out, they kind of have the shelves by the door and just this book just kind of jumped off the shelf at me and it was called Introvert Power by Lori Helgo. And um, the name itself really says how I feel about the book, Introvert Power. Like there was a great power in introversion and there were things in there that she really turned me on to. Like we talked about like half the population are introverts, 
Like a lot of people don't think that because they don't really understand what introversion is. You can have some very confident and outspoken, but yet introverts, and they're part of that 50%. And you might not, in your mind, you might not be including them. Mm -hmm. But it was just really about embracing that power. And there's many others, but that book has been very influential to me. Mm. That's not one I've read. So I will definitely add that to my list. And yeah, what you said. I've seen lists of like actors and celebrities and famous people that you wouldn't think of as introverts, but yet they are. And that just goes back to what we were saying. It doesn't necessarily mean you're quiet in social settings or you don't like people because they may seem like very friendly, outgoing people, but it's how they need to think and recharge and approach the world as opposed to necessarily their outgoing personality or what they might seem like in a public setting. Yeah. And you can have an outgoing personality. I mm. mean, introverts absolutely can. I've worked and talked with people and they're still kind of embracing that. They're like, uh, well, I can't be an introvert. And if I know them really well, it's like, that's what makes you brilliant mm -hmm. is your ability to think deeply. Yes. Doesn't mean you're shy. Like we've been talking about, doesn't mean you don't like people, but you're brilliant because you're an introvert because you are a deep thinker. You, you take time to analyze that situation or give that situation some, some serious thought. And that's what makes you brilliant. So embrace that. Yes, I agree. Lean into that and use that for good. It's not going to change. <laughs> right. And it's a good thing. Yes. You know, and it's just, you know, I gave my silly little example that I go deep in thought and I didn't choose that. It's how I came for some reason. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's not going to change, but I don't want to change it either. Mm -hmm. And it's how you operate best is when you give yourself that room to think and process. Yeah. Oh. And if you're not getting what you want out of life, you can figure that out. Mm -hmm. You can figure out who am I? What do I need to get? what I want. Do I want more social time? You can get that, mm -hmm. but you just got to figure out what it is that you want, why you might not be getting that, but getting to know yourself and some other resources we've been talking about, you can figure that out. Right. Which things are draining and which things are fulfilling and enriching for you. And it'll be different from your spouse or your friend or the person you work with. It's different for each person. Yeah. And we've hit on this too. What's your expectations? You know, not what's somebody else's. Or I always talk about too, what's fun to you? Because mm -hmm. you may have an idea of fun that somebody else might think, oh, that's silly. Mm -hmm. But don't let people tell you what's fun. You know what's fun for you. Right. Sometimes when you're with people you care about, you know, you might do something that they like more than you and right. vice versa. But at the same time, but you know what you want to do, what what you enjoy, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's been helpful for me too of those boundaries of being able to say no to certain types of invitations or activities like, mm, no, that is not my thing. I don't have the bandwidth because I know how draining that's going to be. So I'm going to say no to that one. And just being able to filter that has been so helpful in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. Well, where can people find you online? Because I know some of our listeners are going to want to learn more. Okay. The easiest place is to go to quietandstrong.com. You can find the podcast there. Podcast is also available pretty much where you find podcasts, but there's blogs on the quietandstrong.com. You can find out more about the book and other things. You can find my social media channels there too. Very good. I will link to everything in the show notes there so people can click through and I look forward to checking out your book myself. All right. Sounds good. Thank you for this. I know this has been useful for me and I have no doubt it'll be useful for our listeners too. So I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. What do you think? Was this insightful for you? I know I really enjoy talking with David about this and I'm glad there are people like him who are leading the way and starting the conversations around this topic and highlighting the strengths of all types of personalities. I really liked his reflection questions for how can we lean into our introverted strengths and continuing to evaluate our strategy. I wanted to quickly recap his four questions. Number one, what strengthened me this week? Number two, how can I do more of that? Number three, what drained me? And number four, how can I use my strengths in the work that I do? Sometimes it's helpful to just sit with a pen and paper or go for a walk and let these things kind of roll around in your head. 
If you are wondering what your next step should be, I would love to support you in that. You can go take my quiz, Do You Have What It Takes to Be a Grant Writer? at teresahuff.com slash quiz. And if you know that nonprofit work is the next right step for you, then I would love to support you. And I'd like to invite you to join me in the Fast Track to Grant Writer program. There are some incredible people who have gone through the program and they are making such a positive impact in the world. And that's what it's all about. We're all here to make a difference. And so we have to choose and decide what kind of difference we'll make and when we're going to do that. The sooner you start taking action, the better. You can join me there at teresahuff.com slash VIP, and it's a 90-day interactive mentoring experience. I'd like to leave you with one final challenge question. Are you an introvert or an extrovert? And how can you better lean into your natural strengths? All right, friends, I hope this gave you some good food for thought this week as you go change your world. Thank you.